Hey guys, Graham here. I trust you are well. Happy Friday or whenever you're watching this. Uh, I come here every Friday to do a live AMA, Ask Me Anything. So try to take five questions from you guys, uh, my community and my partners uh, every week. So hey, if you have a question, feel free to add it to the comments while we're live or you can email me. Just go to gjm.org. All of the ways of connecting with me are there. Hey, I'll be back at the end of this session as well with uh, just an offer we have at the moment and some news. But let me just mention again, if you're new to my YouTube channel, I'm really working this summer about building up the subscriber base and the watch time. So thank you all of you who subscribed. If you haven't subscribed, why? Now, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing that. Hit the red button down there in the corner and give the bell a long press for about two or three seconds. And I would really appreciate that. And uh, probably the best way of connecting with me, if, if you go to gjm.org, gjm.org. Links are in the show notes uh, for our email newsletter, the School of Ministry, some of the events. I'm going to be speaking in Pennsylvania this weekend. Um, so all of that good stuff. Good. Well, I'm going to jump into the questions I have here. Chance for a cup of tea. Mm. So, um, first question I have here from Matt. Hey, Matt, how are you doing, mate? Is how do we grow as Christians? Other than reading the word, how do we grow? It's a great question. Um, let me give you five quick answers to that. But before I do that, I let me just take a couple of moments to speak about the need to grow. You know, if there's two... I like to say if there's one word and maybe two words that God is speaking to the body of Christ, I think it's this, grow up. Yeah, you have, uh, there are two massive camps within Christianity. And then there's some of us who are in a tiny third camp. The camps go like this. There's a lot of the church that basically says God's got all of this awesome stuff for us, the church. But it will happen after we die or after Jesus returns or in the millennial. It's sort of this camp that says, guys, we've just got the Bible right now. Jesus has left us. Hunker down. Make it through. You know, just don't stick your head above the paraplete. It's the Alamo mentality. But we're left here. God is of the sacred flame. And one day Jesus is going to return for us. And it will become all cool. And we'll, we'll step into the fullness of all God's got for us. Group number one. I reject that with every atom of my being. There's a second group who are much more akin to where I am. Many kind of charismatics, some of the pro house movements, whatever, that say, no, there's this glorious revival coming. Jesus isn't coming back for a beaten up church. He's coming back for a glorious bride. And we don't have to wait till we die of the millennial for the world to see a church that looks and acts and thinks and speaks and smells like Jesus. I say amen to those brethren. Here's where I draw a, a line of differential between myself and some of those guys. I think some of them say, well, what we've got to do is we've got to pray for revival. If we get enough people in enough football stadiums asking God to send revival, send revival, send revival, send revival. And in a way, they're saying, no, there is this glorious move of God that's out there. But what we've got to do is either wait for it or call for it or um, get ready for it or just keep imploring God to do it. And then I think there's a third group. <laughs> I I am I I reject both of those premises. I don't think we need to wait for anything. And I also don't believe we need to beg God for anything. I think he's already given it. John 1 verse 12 verse 16 of his fullness have we all received. Mm. Colossians 1 um, 9 and 10 in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The next verse says you are complete in him. And my theology and I'm right. I really mean that is this, that, that God's given everything Jesus had. He emptied himself of at Calvary, that you and my I might have that fullness. Now, the fullness of the new creation, the fullness of his righteousness, the fullness of his spirit. It's not coming one day. It's already here. We don't need in a way to ask God to pour out his spirit. God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. What we need to do, here's the key. Galatians says that when you're a if you're a child born in the royal house, for instance, but you're still a child, you, you're still under tutor, you're under a nanny, you're not, although you're like a little Prince William, Prince Harry, whatever, until you come to maturity, you don't get to exercise the authority and power you have. So I think God's given everything we need, all things that pertain to life and godliness come through the knowledge of him called the Bible, who calls us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So I think that in a way, God's, God's already done all he needs to do. What the church needs to do is grow up. 
I think God has the vehicle there, the car keys. The car is gassed up, if you will, ready to go, but he's not going to give the car keys to a five-year-old. And so the the issue is not waiting till we die or waiting to try to get God in a good mood and beg him to give something that he's already given. The issue is you and I growing and getting to the place where God can release us. We grow up. The goal of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they're not there to do the work of the ministry. They're there to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. What does the next verse say? Pause for tea. That we be no longer children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but speaking the word, the truth, in the context of love, that's church, that's relationship, we'd grow up into him, grow up into him, to the stature of the fullness of the measure of Christ. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't he, when I was a child, I had the language of a child. I had the reasoning, the epistemology, the understanding as a child, and I engaged with childish thoughts. And then he said, but when I grew, I put away from me childish things. I'm not answering your question here, Matt, but I'm just agreeing with you, man. We need to grow up. So often people will come into my office where I am right now and they're they're saying, cast this out of me and pray that I'll be free out of that and pray that I'll get over this situation. And, you know, we can help people to a measure. There are some things, though, you don't need deliverance of. You just need to grow up. You need to grow up. You need to get you need to get over them. I don't mean get over them in an emotional I mean get up, get over them, arise over those situations. So I think the Lord is saying grow up. How do we grow? Let me give you five quick ways. Number one, uh, 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, as newborn babes desire earnestly, passionately desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So I would, I'd challenge anybody and say, Do you love Jesus? Yes, we all love Jesus. If Jesus and the Word are one, if Jesus is the Word and the Word is Jesus, how much time did we spend with Jesus today? How much time did we spend with the Word today? And I don't say that to condemn or to belittle or put down or devalue anybody. What I actually mean is that we we should plan. If we don't plan to spend time with the Word, we're really planning to not spend time with the Word so number one, I would desire the sincere milk of the word. I mean, read brand new baby Christian, read through the Gospels, read just Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, read through the New Testament, you know, start at Genesis and read through. It's good to understand it and pick it and understand all those things. Check into my school of ministry for a greater understanding of the word. But the bottom line is read it. Just read it, read it. Desire the sincere milk. A baby doesn't understand the nutrients and the nourishment and the proteins Um, the carbs or whatever that are being passed to it through its mother's milk, but it needs it and it likes it and it causes it to grow. So the the word is milk. Yeah, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The second key I'd say to grow is grow in fellowship with the Lord. This is a really big one. And I genuinely believe that (laughs) I'd say 99% of Christians are very little experiential fellowship with the Lord. You know, I I think most Christians, their only real warmth and fellowship and time they spend loving him is in church for half an hour or a lot less in some churches and um, walk with him, talk with him. The place to learn to hear God's voice is not in some conference or watching a Graham Jones YouTube video. (laughs) It's, It's walking with God day by day by day, walk with him, talk with him, bring your frustrations to him, listen to him, fellowship with him. Spend time with him. Literally, fellowship, it means to be the same, to be fellows in a ship. <laughs> it means to be pulled together. You know, I sometimes say, uh, God wants to go on a road trip with you. When you're road tripping, you're fellows in a ship. It's like two guys stuck together in a car, you know, with 500 miles to travel. You talk, you know, you, you have conversations that it's hard to have in an, in an office or in a, a sim- small session. So, Road trip with Jesus, fellowship with Jesus. Good. Key number three, grow in love. And it's quite easy to love God because you're really, really lovely. But you really grow in love by loving people who are not lovely. It's called church. And God will make sure that you are not in a perfect church. And uh, he'll make sure God wants you to be around people. People is where you learn to love. People is where you learn to love. So we can we can be alone and I love you, Lord. And then God says, if you love me who you can't see, but you don't love your brother who you can't, James, um, y- your faith isn't that real. Now, it doesn't mean we don't we don't have a faith isn't real, but we're not 
being real with our faith. So I would say everybody should have a, a home church, a community, people you're with at least once a week. I don't mean you're on vacation, but I mean, it's not this, I'll drop in once a month and say hi. There are no regional Christians. Yeah. You may have a lot of regional friends, but you have one family and one tribe. And the people you're with every week who know you, who know your kids, where you can do, you can heal the sick and cast out devils, but where you can take the trash out. Mm-hmm and clean the bathrooms and do whatever. And uh, so have a tribe and learn to love people. And in a way, we, we learn to do that when we we're in a situation where we reach the end of our human love. That's where divine love starts, where you, you, you know, it's like Jesus said, Peter, do you, he really said, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter said, yes, I feel you. you. He's saying, G Peter, Peter, do you love me with divine supernatural love? And Peter said, like, you're my friend. I, you're my companion. I love you with brotherly love, filio, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it takes more than brotherly love. It takes heavenly love. So I would say we grow by growing in love. Find the person you find hard to love and ask God to teach you to love them. Go love them. Go bless them. Not because of what you can get out of it. Jesus said, we're no better than the Pharisees. If that's all we do, we love those who love us back. But we love unconditionally. We love with no thought or no ambition or no hope of return. That's what the master did. And we should walk even as he walks. Good. Uh, key number four, how do we grow? We grow in our faith. Mm. So faith comes by hearing the word of God. Ba -boom. But faith goes as well. Faith grows. You know, strength comes by eating good food. But uh, strength grows by usage, by exercise. So here's my challenge to you today. Learn about faith. I have some great teachings here. Did a series recently on how to grow in your faith. What are you using your faith for right now? Where is your faith invested? What have you believed you have received that your eyes have not yet seen and yet your heart's fully persuaded you already have? If that's a mouthful, press stop, rewind, and go back and hear it again, because it's an important thing. Where's your faith invested? Where are you using your faith for? Um, I think if we're not, if our faith is not invested in that way, we're not growing in faith. Again, you don't grow in faith simply by impartation. You grow in faith by using that faith. So I would say find something to believe God for. And in a way, one of the best things is when you believe God for other people. But find somebody who needs 100 bucks and believe God for them. Find somebody who needs something, you know, that, that you don't have and just, just stretch out and believe God to, to meet that need. Yeah, I, I think we grow in faith. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Start believing God for $100 to give and then believe him for two and then four and then five and then a thousand and start where you're at. Don't say one day I'll have great faith. It's really easy to read a book like, you know, the, the biographies of somebody like Wigglesworth. I love that man. And yet people would, you know, people used to come to him and say, how do you get great faith? And he'd always answer with Mark 4, first the grain, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. He's basically saying a full corn, a harvest of um, corn comes from a tiny grain of corn and then a little sprout and then an ear and then the full corn in the ear. He's saying plant your faith, use your faith. You know, we, we get this crazy idea that Jesus wants little faith like a grain of mustard seed. When Jesus said have faith like a grain of mustard seed, he wasn't saying have a little faith because Jesus rebuked people for having little faith. What Jesus was saying is have a faith that even if it's so small, you can plant it and it will grow. Come on, it's priceless. Boom. Hey, the last area we should grow in as well, and I'm going to do a whole new teaching series on this soon, so I know I can't unpack this, but grow in our, our knowledge, our identity of ourselves as new creations. In a way, the whole of Christianity works like this. God's given you everything already. It's all done. It's all finished. It's all paid for. You've already got everything you'll ever need. And then what we need to do is grow in our understanding, the renewing of our mind, growing in our appreciation of who we are and what God's done. And if we don't grow up in our identity, we stay as babies. In a way, you're no longer a sinner, you're a new creation, but we need to grow in our understanding, our appreciation of that truth. Boom. So there's five areas we can grow in. Grow in the word, grow in fellowship with the Lord, grow in love, grow in your faith, and grow in your identity in Jesus Christ. Good. Well, I'm going to jump into another question right now.